Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Brooke Thomas, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Vanessa Scotto. On the show, we're talking about being on the awakening path and what does that actually mean? What is a real evolution of our lives? How do we ultimately embrace everything, all the beauty and crazy, the joys and the messes, the bliss and the grit that is a human life? In this episode, we're excited to catch up with each other and to integrate some of what we've experienced recently in the presence of so many amazing guest conversations, in particular, our recent one with David Thomas. We're exploring conditioning again, but after being with David, we're posing the question to ourselves, what if it's all conditioning? What if, while we're in ego consciousness, all of our thoughts, all of our thoughts are simply products of our culture and lineage that become habitual? And if so, what would that mean about how we can shift out of our chronic patterns of suffering? If you're enjoying the show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You can write a review on iTunes or on our Facebook page. You can head over to blissandgrit.com to subscribe, which just sends you our weekly digest. Or you can become a supporting member at patreon.com forward slash blissandgrit. Also, Vanessa and I do work privately with clients as they navigate this path. So sessions with us can be another way to support our work and at the same time to get some good support for yourself. Last thing before we head into the conversation, Vanessa and I do swear. I recall being full on potty mouth this episode here and there. So headphones if you have kids around. Okay, here we go. Hi, Brooke. Hey, Vanessa. So it's been, I don't know, three weeks, four weeks since we've spoken just the two of us, I think. I know, it's lovely. It's reunion time. I know it's been a while. It's been a beautiful fall. We've had so many interesting and powerful guest conversations, I feel like. Yeah, and it took us a little by surprise. It just all, I mean, we weren't planning on making a marathon of interviews or conversations, whatever you want to call them, but there have been a lot this fall, so. I know it's crazy, actually, going from, let's say, Will Pye talking about how he could experience his brain tumor as a blessing Mm -hmm. to Jeannie Zandi completely rocking and reconfiguring the way that I look at things, including my own process and our culture. And then into David, which had a profound effect on me. So there's been a lot. And we thought today, let's just see if we can't integrate in real time because I haven't done much integration on my own. (laughs) All right. Game At on. least certainly not conscious integration, right? It's it's like we sit with these people and something profound shifts inside of you yeah. as we're being exposed to their fields of energy, you know, their God vibes, as David would say, or, you know, as the insights are funneling through. But, you know, to sit down consciously and say, hmm, what's up with this for me? You know, how am I relating with this is different. So, I wanted to start to talk about something that's been striking me personally from David's conversation that we aired last week. (sighs) Let me see how I could put this into words. So here's something I took from it, and you can correct me if you saw this differently, Brooke. But when I walked away out of that conversation, I think I got in a more clear way than ever, because it's not the first time I'm exposed to this, that every single thought you have, feeling you have, preference you have, that that there's conditioning involved. Mm. I remember when we went to see Matt Kahn. I don't know if it was the first time, but one of the times we were on retreat with him. And I remember him saying, do you know how much of this that you're feeling or thinking is personal? And he said, zero percent. <laughs> In his kind of Matt Conway, right? way. <laughs> and I remember thinking, zero percent? That seems so unaccountable, right? 
That's always my reaction to these things. That's so unaccountable. But here's the crazy part after listening to David. What if the thought that that's unaccountable is conditioning? Mm -hmm. So you all, if you've been listening for a while, might know that I had gotten mold illness a while back. And um, what mold illness does is it triggers your brain the same way that PTSD does because it creates this limbic system loop, right? That creates all of this fear and running. And my nutritionist, who's amazing, recommended recently I do this program. It's called DNRS. And I forgot what it stands for. But for those who are interested, though, the book is Wired for Healing, and we'll put it in the show notes, just because I can feel people going, what is it? We will yeah, put it in the show I, notes. I got it. Dynamic Neural Reintegration, Dynamic Neural Reintegration, something like that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's a rewiring of your brain. Now, you and I, Brooke, read this book, Wired for Healing, and it struck us, you know, it's a really powerful thought process that we can rewire our brains. But they were talking about turning away in a certain regard, like not allowing your focus to stay on your body, your health, your negative thoughts, and rather turning towards other aspects of your experience that were happening at the same time. And hopefully a positive one or a grateful one. And you and I are like, I don't know, you know, total spiritual bypass. And But when my nutritionist was telling me about it, because she had participated in the program, she said, that's just your conditioning saying that. Mm. Now, like, that's kind of interesting. And, and I do want to talk about bypass and how we discern from this, because that's a very real thing. And we all know that. But let's just for the beginning, start to explore the crazy, amazing, potentially liberating notion that most of what we're thinking is taught to us by a broken culture and often, sadly, by an unhealthy lineage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who've existed within this broken culture and, and broken many culture, yeah, back through time, <laughs> going way, yeah. way back. Yeah, this is, so what it's brought me into contact with, because you and I have talked about this some just conversationally, off, we do talk off the air <laughs> um, in the last week, and I would say David's conversation with us has been dismantling me in some pretty wonderful ways. Like he feels like a bright light that's just like, rushing fresh air, <laughs> you know, like whew, just fresh air here, God vibes only. So it's affected me deeply and is affecting me deeply. Like that continues to, to percolate and move through the system. And, and what it's brought me really intimately in contact with is when you're on, for lack of better terminology, this path, as you go and go and go and shed and shed and shed and come more and more into contact with your self, capital S, and with reality, capital R, and whatever all these faulty words are that we want to use, that the, the subtlety, the nuance that you have to have the capacity to hold, and by hold, I mean living it as an inquiry, like there's this curiosity like, is this true? This little felt sense over here? What about this? Like that you're always willing to, to inquire, not in the like inspector gadget <laughs> kind of monocle hunting down, playing detective kind of way, but in this very deeply subtle way. So we can say that there are things that you and I hold very dear and are hugely why we do this show and those remain true and then they just keep dissolving into more and more and more refined layers so some of the things that we hold very deeply very much in our hearts that we want to bring forward in our own lives and our own selves and in the world are like the harm of spiritual bypass the harm of spiritual ego making 
the way that positive psychology, power of positive thinking, law of attraction can be annihilating to individuals and be abusive. Um, these are all things that we hold incredibly dear and still do and are very true. And then because we are all in innocence conditioned in a culture of duality, we play, we just do play hot potato for a long time. You know, like we can get to a, a deeper layer of truth about, um, conditioning or spiritual bypass. And like, I can, I can see, I'll have this epiphany, this clarity about spiritual bypass in particular in myself, because that's the only thing we actually have. So maybe I'll see the way I was spiritual ego making, right. And like, Oh, I was doing that thing where I kind of turn away and, you know, whatever it was in any given moment, because there's plenty of, of times, plenty of layers that that's happened. And so it's like hot potato, like, okay, so that's not the thing to do anymore. So I'm going to go to the opposite extreme. So now I'm going to, I don't want to go up and away. I don't want to turn away. I don't want to bright side. I don't want to gloss over or like push my vibes way up and out. And like, I just don't understand all the suffering in the world or whatever. So I'm going to go over to this other extreme and I'm going to, in my case, because I'm very somatic, I'm very kinesthetic, really feel all these things that are genuinely in there. They're not make-believe. Grief, shame, despair, anxiety. And like, okay, I'm going to really come home to them. I'm going to really allow them. Mm -hmm. And then it's so funny because if I grab onto that in the way that the mind or the separate self moves so quickly, I can go, oh, okay. Like without my conscious awareness, it becomes the new me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, this is the good one. I used to think that one over there with the big high vibes and cute words or whatever, like was the good one, but I decided she's the bad one. So now I'm going to be over here and she's the good one. And that's the bad one. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I hit a layer where I go, Oh, I'm identifying with suffering to the point that I'm, I'm just suffering needlessly, all pain, no gain. So I could hot potato again, right? And like, okay, so I'm not going to do the high vibe spiritual ego thing, but I'm going to do the positive psychology, whatever, on and on and on and on. We all do this a million times in our lives where we ping and pong and ping and pong. And then you've pinged and ponged enough. And in our case, you have the chance to sit with people who don't ping and pong. <laughs> and you feel the expanse of this middle ground and you feel the nuance. If you're not going to grab on and define one thing or the other, there's this whole wide range of open space. And so for me, the, the layer of that that I'm up against right now is like exactly what you're saying and exactly what David was pointing to. Like, Oh my God, it's all identity making and innocence unconsciously, but very quickly without me realizing, I just start to put my little <laughs> identity tendrils around the new identity, the new good one, right way, you know, all that kind of stuff, the right way to heal, the genuine what, blah, blah, blah. But as that sheds and sheds, and we have the chance to sit with someone like David who just like lays it right out there. It's like, what the fuck do you do in that place? Where it's just the, you encounter the wide open field and like the wide open field. And I've had our time together, little glimpses here and there, but it just keeps going, just keeps dropping away. Probably because it is so incredibly hard for us not to try to think this through, right. not to believe our thoughts, not to try to understand who am I? What's my purpose? You know, what am I here for? You know, all of these questions that so many of us are consistently entertaining as if that will give us the answer to life. And we've had the 
pleasure of hearing over and over again from multiple sources, um, you're not going to find the purpose or the meaning or the answer through the mind because the mind is, um, well, let's just say not the mind, but the thought process is conditioned. It was fed to us somewhere. Like David said something in the interview, like you don't get to keep any thoughts, not one thought. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's fairly mind altering because we think, well, we get to hang on to the good thoughts or we get to hang on to the thoughts about who I am. Cause that's what we're really thinking that we're looking for. I feel mm -hmm. when I started on the path, at least it's like, well, who am I really, you know, and also what the hell is the purpose of all this? But who am I was a big piece of this. So we go out and the mind is seeking who am I, but it keeps trying to do it through thought, not feeling and being not experiencing, right? So we're always self-reflecting. Oh, I'm this person and I'm that person. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, I was speaking with a client and we, what came into my mind as her and I were speaking was the whole introversion, extroversion spectrum, for example. So we're taught this is a spectrum and this is real. Maybe it is. I'm not saying it's not. But I started to think, well, all people seem to need people around. Like humans are designed for connection. And most people seem to benefit from some time alone. So what if it's not a real thing? What if extroversion is an identity of someone who's come to get validation through contact with people? Mm -hmm. And introversion is an identity of someone who's got overwhelm as part of their pattern of contact with people. So... But as we believe I'm an introvert or an extrovert, we take it on as an identity and we design our whole life around it. Right. But what if this is just a concept? You know, um, in David's interview on Boot at the Gas Pump that Brooke and I both found him through, that was how we first contacted him. He was telling this story about school and you and I touched on this a little bit in, in our interview, but he didn't really get into it. And he was talking about how the first time he learned words like knowledge and realized there was a K in front of the N, but the K was silent. Hmm. He had this very deep thought like, holy shit, everyone's just making shit up. <laughs> Yeah, like, this it. is garbage. Like, right. that, oh, if you say so, <laughs> making up <laughs> rules, right? And, uh, you know, I remember years ago reading a quote by Steve Jobs, and he said something to this effect like, once you realize everyone's just pretending and everyone's just <laughs> making stuff up, right. you start to be able to play with the matrix differently. He obviously worded it different than I'm saying it, but and also and I thought that was a really groovy quote. <laughs> than David. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a really groovy quote, but I don't really think I got it experientially. But I'm starting to get it. Like, hot damn, everyone's making shit up. Like, I might be worried about what so and so thinks of me, or so and so thinks of me, but why they're just making stuff up right, right? They and don't then actually know they don't have deep contact with me <laughs> or reality half the time right. they're just doing what they were taught about something from someone else who was probably fairly dysfunctional and didn't have contact with reality and they thought and mostly it's my thoughts about what they're thinking so it's not even them so it's just me making stuff up mm -hmm. but what I make up defines my experience of reality. Now, you and I understand that some of the complexity of this is that once these thought structures and identity structures are in place, they do seem to come with some physiological um, wiring, right? They, they come into place in a way that they affect the body. So if I have an identity as an introvert, it's not that there's not some physical reality to the overstimulation that happens with people. It's just that once it's an identity, it's locked into place and it defines this character that is Vanessa in a certain way. And it's hard to get liberation. So, you know, I was watching the movie A Beautiful Mind. And if any of you haven't seen it, it's about this Nobel um, Prize winner, mathematician who had schizophrenia and learned to essentially navigate his schizophrenia. I think he was also on medication, side note, but learned to navigate his schizophrenia by identifying those voices aren't real. I can't listen to them. So, you know, I'm watching it going, well, what's the difference with what he did and what 
this DNRS program saying like, this is just limbic hijack repeating itself in thought form versus what David's saying about, Hey man, all your thoughts, just thoughts, just <laughs> made up by someone and probably someone screwed up because they were all raised in a fairly screwed up culture. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So what's the difference? And then I started to think, well, you know, you and I believe that we can't ignore it, right? We can't avoid it. That doesn't work. We've tried that. Bypass doesn't work. That's why it's not a path. Yeah, that's why we're not but, interested. <laughs> yeah, it's just right. a bunch of bullshit that causes more harm to yeah. the self and to others. <laughs> exactly. So you can't bypass it, but you also can't necessarily believe your thoughts. You can believe your feelings, but they're influenced by your thoughts. So man, does this start to get really like going down a rabbit hole into yeah. Alice in Wonderland territory. Totally. And we spend so much internal time without being aware of it at all, trying to make sure we're the ones having the right kinds of thoughts. And so it's not even like that we're taking the thoughts off the table in the way that David so elegantly and directly did in his conversation with us. We're like, okay, because we've just we think we are them. Yeah. We believe we think they're real. We think they're real. We think that they're real because we're thinking them. And so if we are thoughtful, empathic people, actually, fuck that. If we're any kind of person, even if we're the world's most harmful person, we spend all of our time internally to ourselves, unconsciously trying to make sure we're having the right kind of thoughts. So the full spectrum of humanity, the world's most healing, loving, tender, ego identified person, and the world's most harmful ego identified person, they're still trying to ferret out, am I the one with the right kind of thoughts? It's how we get object consciousness, right? I'm the good kind of object, they're the bad kind of object, or this is the right kind of way to heal, that's the wrong kind of way to heal, whatever the things are. So we're spending so much time believing that we are the thoughts. We're not taking it off the table completely. So it's this constant mad dash to reinvent ourselves. Or basically, we're investing all of our energy in just getting more and more lost in the corn maze. So as we've been exploring these things in conversation since talking with David, you know, you and I personally, and as this program has come up, what's it called? DN DNRS. DNRS. Um, what I have been dealing with, which I've been really open about on the show, is like as I've gone through this process of waking up, there's been it's differed a lot. Like there was an acute period that was very intense for five months. It's much lighter now, but it's still there of really intense sensation, anxiety, strong emotions, things like this. So early on, it's like, it made sense, especially as somebody who has a history of trauma, has a history of anxiety, blah, blah, to kind of feel those sensations and go, oh, okay. I need to turn towards them. Like, I think this is one of the key things that we want to discuss. Like, oh, okay, I'm turning towards the unpleasantness that, that has been uncovered and that is there, that I feel. And there was a period of time where that felt like a healing thing. Like, it just needed permission to exist. It just needed permission to move through my system and not be getting sat on anymore. There was nothing to sit on it anymore. And so it just moved through. And then now I'm at the place where if I feel it, which is still kind of a daily occurrence, let's say it's like a yucky feeling in the gut or like a, you know, different flavors of anxiety. Ew, why do I feel ugh, ick? It's that phantom limb pain. It's a different variety of it than what I was talking about with David in the conversation where I'm like, I, it's just doing itself, right? So I can go one of two ways with it mentally. I can say, oh, okay, 
Um, it's because there's something I really need to listen to here. Something really needs to be healed. That might be true. But the other one is like, no, it's just <laughs> a fucking habit. At this stage, it's really just, and it's because it, in innocence, so quickly got wired in my mind. It's important to always turn towards these ick sensations, which had this funny way of like holding ick sensation in place because it, it was like, oh, it's like playing fetch with your dog, right? That's what we do with the ego. Go find this. Go fetch. It's like, go find ick sensation. I got it, boss. Like, <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> Here's your ick sensation that you want to pay attention to. Now, nobody would ever choose that. It's awful. And there is a real truth to how does this get imprinted in the system? How does this get imprinted in our nervous systems. And you and I are very passionate about what is the intersection here because we can meditate, we can inquire, we can get all kinds of really, really, really useful insight from listening to teachers and guides. And, and I think all those things are critical. And there's also this nervous system piece, this habit. What is the habit, habits that our systems are running unconsciously? Because once you start to tug that thread past all the other threads, right? Like have, you can really contact your own divine nature. You can really have wonderful gurus and, and guides and teachers. You can really have so many epiphanies and there can be this janky wiring that keeps you trapped in hell or at least permits you to visit there frequently but it's just the phantom limb pain mm. that's probably why so many teachers recommend meditation even though you and I know that that could become an identity and a crutch, but it's probably why, because in the space of silence, you have the opportunity to see the part of the human program mm. that keeps trying to own something, you know, trying to lock it down or create an identity around something. Cause I, I guess I'm getting the sense as you're talking, I was thinking, well, I, you know, when people have awakened to the truth of reality, they can meet all of these things without attaching identity to them because that's what awakening means. Right. No more identity, no more identifying, no more reference points. But when we're still in the operating system that doesn't know its soul, its God, its source, its everything, then that's the habit of the operating system. You know, just the habit of this body mind is, okay, great. Now, what do I do with this? How do I make sense out of this? What does this mean to me? What does this mean about me? Like, that's what it's always doing. So it, it's really interesting to start to get hip to that fact that most of this, most of what you're thinking is a constructed reality and not just in some theoretical way. I mean, that's what we're trying to convey here is we're getting it experientially because I mean, hello, I've read about this for 20 years. Yeah, probably. right. I know. I could quote this right, from books duh, for a long right? time, like, but experiencing <laughs> it is different. Yeah. Right. Like the world is a mirror of you. Like what were they trying to say? You know, like, mm -hmm. it's always happening in here. It's like what David was saying. You know, if you, if you say the flower smells, but the smells happening in here, mm. or if I say Jane doesn't like me, but that thought is me having a perception of Jane. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's always happening in here. And these truths have been part of my life for, for so long, but to deeply sit with just as a, in, as an inquiry, I'm not making it even a statement, but to deeply sit with, what if none of this is me, not the good thoughts, not the bad thoughts, not the, you know, idealizable self, not the shameful suffering self, like to really sit with that as an inquiry is so expansive. And so I do think about like, so what does that mean? 
And maybe it is just a process. You know, you described different phases and I agree. You know, for me, there were different phases of coming to life. You know, first for me to even turn towards myself, my wounds, my inner child with a modicum of compassion was almost impossible. Mm hmm. Like that was the first phase. Like, can I just look without going into a shame reaction? And then it was like, can I meet it? Can I recognize it's it's not me and it's not going to overwhelm me and that I have the strength to be present even as feeling and emotion and memory was coursing through my body. And then now it's something like then we were like, well, can I love it? Can I bring tenderness towards it? Right. So there's all of these different phases. And as I've been like integrating everyone that we speak with, I'm like, when you heard David talk about 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus sitting in the desert Mm. and Buddha also sat under the Bodhi tree, they have like extremely similar stories. And I talk about this a lot with myself, with clients. I always talk about this because Let's just take, for example, the way Buddha sat there, he sat there and what we can call demons were dancing in front of him. And every time he would point to them and he would say, I see you, Mara, which means I see you, illusion. Mm -hmm. I see you, delusion. Right. And each time they would then disappear and the next one would come until he realized none of this is capital R reality. It is all some inherited construction. Right. So that to me brings me power. Like I I feel really like grounded when I imagine just sitting there on the earth watching as these different thought forms or identities or ideas about how life should be and who we should be and what it all means goes dancing before me. And I'm like, I see you. I see you for what you are. But then I feel that that love piece has to be the thing, Mm. like the super secret sauce. (laughs) I know. I almost know. I love it. Yeah, I know. I know. (laughs) Brooke's laughing at a Rick and Morty joke. I embedded in that (laughs) by mistake, (laughs) sort of. (laughs) So, you know, did David say it in our interview or the other one? I think he said it in both. He was talking about he sometimes still dreams about demons. He had a really, mm. really painful childhood, if if you all don't know that. But he still sometimes dreams about demons and he meets them with love, he said. He hugs them. Hey, demon, because he thinks they want love, too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it, right? Yeah. Like the illusions, the delusions. But when we can meet it with love, what are we doing in effect? What we're really doing is remembering that we're everything, mm. right? To be love is to recognize you are love. And it is to embody, to experience, to allow the soul to take center stage of your consciousness Mm. as opposed to the identity projects. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense for you? It makes absolute sense. I mean, I think that my bias, like the wiring of this one, has a bias towards, you know, truth and clarity and, you know, justice. Like, I guess I'm saying I have a tendency to be judgy, <laughs> right way, wrong way, good guys, <laughs> bad guys. In a nice way. What I'm saying is that's historically reality for me. And so like anything, if that's my normal mode of operating, this path of, of opening and awakening took that form for a long time. It was a lot of seeing with clarity myself, my habits, my patterns, the way that I projected on the world, what was actually happening in reality versus what my mind was telling me was happening in reality. That kind of clarity was and is so healing for me. But because I'm prone to taking that to an extreme called judgment, (laughs) what that meant was there was a way that I was waking up to the like mechanics of the separate self. And all of that was true. Everything I was seeing was true. But I was still kind of hardening in my heart. I think in so many ways, just because it's my blind spot, 
it was just totally unfamiliar ground, you know, so I could see with a great deal of clarity, but I would spend my time being like, you know, oh, I see the right way. I see the pain body in me or in the culture, or I see blah, blah, blah. And it was actually, you know, beginning to work with very, very deeply heart-centered teachers, in particular, um, John Prendergast, John Prendergast and Matt Kahn found me. I found them around the same time. Um, Jeannie Zandi as well. Like, and these are all people that really, to me, feel that they live from the heart. And so by being with them and, uh, you know, turning my awareness, my attention towards their teachings, I could have the experience of living from the heart. And I would say that that was when the real freedom started to come into my life. That was when the real softness, and that was when I could really do the work that I've always wanted to do since I was born, which is to be useful, you know, to be a healing force in the world. Also to enjoy my life because it's the only one I get to have. Like David was pointing to really clearly, like it's just me in here. I'm the only one I get. Um, but that I could finally meet the world and myself at the same time from a loving place. And it was this really profound epiphany of like, oh, that's the real thing. Because if I'm always like taking the scalpel, to find. And I think we can do that with the kinds of conversations that you and I are having right now. Like, okay, if it's all conditioning, if it's all thoughts, if none of it is me, I'm going to get out my scalpel. <laughs> like, how do we cut out all the parts that aren't true? And if we haven't experienced what's left after it all goes, that can feel really destabilizing for starters. And it's also just a really aggressive way to be towards the self and that always automatically translates to how we are towards the world as well. So I have come to the place for me again, because like my pendulum swing can benefit from swinging a little more over towards the heart side that if I prioritize genuine love, genuine resting in the heart, and, you know, Jeannie's conversation, the most recent one that we had with her on embodying yin, I think carries that across very well, too, it's, which is why she and David were such a nice one-two punch. But, like, this is what it feels like to rest in your being with full permission to exist. And that automatically means that the world has full permission to exist. And then we can soften into this wide open field, this wide open ground without it being, again, the mind's habit of moving very quickly to like, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? What's the right way to excise all conditioning? You know, we, right. we have How to do, do it from the heart. This? Yeah, it has to happen <laughs> from the heart. I just got him. A line from the Jetsons, in case any of you are old enough to remember that I cartoon. Am. Where he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, Jane, stop this crazy thing. It's like that When one feeling. of their machines would go awry. Yeah. yeah, it's like, we just want to stop this crazy thing called suffering. We want to stop it. And so it's very innocent to say, okay, so now here's the pathway. And you, you know, you and I were speaking before about how interesting it is that we've conceptually understood a lot of this for a long time now, but there's a huge maturational journey for us, at least there was between the conceptual understanding and the lived experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's the tricky part. Cause it's like you were saying, if you, if you don't have a lived experience of yourself outside of your thoughts, the whole thing can be murky and destabilizing, right? You can try to cut out what's real, right? You can judge your personality. You can do all sorts of funny, unhealthy, unhelpful movements. Sort of like if we were to look for a basic rule of thumb, 
if what you're doing leaves you feeling nothing but the void, something's off. Right. If what you're doing leaves you feeling nothing but fear and suffering, something's off. Mm -hmm. If what you're doing leaves you feeling a little of relief and a little tenderness, maybe that's a good path. Let's keep exploring, mm -hmm. right? Let's stay curious um, to the ever changing, ever unfolding kind of journey ahead of us. Because it is interesting. I mean, you and I know even these wonderful awakened teachers that we speak with, they all have personalities. Mm -hmm. There's something that doesn't get cut away. But this identity structure that we're constantly creating and recreating, that's what falls away. But that's so inconceivable because we keep trying to conceive of it through the mind. Mm hmm. And I think that was the other thing that David kept offering back. And, you know, quite frankly, a lot of teachers keep offering this back. But since he was the recent one we spoke with, he kept offering back like you're only your being. You are your heart. Mm -hmm. You are that which is unnameable, which is ununderstandable. <laughs> <laughs> la, 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 la. Right? Remember that story that Matt Kahn told about how uh, there's like, you know, the gates to heaven and, you know, it's, it's like the ego walks up to the gates, like the ego personality walks up to the gates and, and the angel's like, you can enter heaven. And the ego's like, okay, great. Let me just understand one more thing about this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is what we're all doing. Okay, great. Just let's Sketch yes. it out. Just Wait. I want to get it in my head a little more. I want to get a diagram going on this. If I could get a real like <laughs> nice diagram, yeah. step one, step two. And like, I want to do that too, because I don't want to suffer. And I most certainly don't want my beloved other humans that are with me in this journey to suffer. I mean, I wanted to add, and I know this is a little going backwards, but when you were talking about judgment and like the mind kind of dissecting, well then wouldn't you think that that means that separate self is active? Cause how can you judge if separate self isn't kind of pulling some of the visual and, and auditory perceptions? Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. Cause if everything's one, what's there to like, if you know you're God and everything's God, what's, there to right yeah yeah so there's a way that it can perpetuate itself yeah. right because it's like it oh i'm going to pull all the threads in. or i'm going to take out the scalpel and cut out all the tumors but it but it, it it needs to believe that the tumors are real right it created the problem it gave you the right. problem to solve and <laughs> yeah. then it tries to solve it right, right. like, like i got whole... this i got this yeah and it might be clear right like oh you don't have to you know tolerate uh, an abusive relationship like that's pretty straightforward but that's called discernment not judgment and right 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 but like right. you can do this thing of like oh they're they're behaving abusively right like yeah. that's clarity that's yeah. clarity but you can scalpelatize it. I love that we're inventing so many words this episode yeah. <laughs> by being like, okay. And what does that look like? What was it in me that allowed it? And what, what, uh, 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 and you can just spend forever, like cutting, punching holes in the fabric. And I know. Well, remember when, uh, David said, um, your, your ego structure will keep putting guards at the gate to heaven. Yeah. And so it will put, I love that guards to the gate. So good. Right. It'll put judgment or and 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 if everything's going good, it'll put, you know, bliss as right. a guard to the yeah. gate to heaven. Uh, You're I'm so just like drooling on the couch. <laughs> caught up in the heaven realm. Nothing here. Right. Who mm -hmm. wants to get out of, you know, that realm into into reality. Right. Into mm -hmm. capital R reality. So I just think, you know, it's really funny. And if we can be lighthearted about it all, which sometimes is a real agonizing movement since things are painful and it's hard to be lighthearted. But ultimately, we know that's what it's about being human. And maybe that's why you need friends on this path, right? Oh, so yeah. that at least we can laugh about this stuff together. Because, I mean, we're talking about 
in what we believe to be human potential awakening that we believe that to be part of a potential that a human has to evolve. I don't know if evolution is the right word, but it's part of their capacity and potential, but it's like big deal shit, right? Like yeah, to say the least. Yeah. We're, we're talking about things that like aren't, um, I don't know. In some ways, don't you feel sometimes Brooke, like I almost feel like why, if we're meant to awaken, did they give us, minds and bodies that are this confusing. <laughs> I feel that way a lot of the time. Where like, like, this just doesn't make sense that this you much know, hell kind realm of game is this <laughs> is possible here. <laughs> well, it just seems like a really confusing game of life because even as we touch reality, like and we touch truth, and then next thing you know, all the identity structures like tumbling back on themselves. <laughs> like, right. Why? Don't I, Aren't we here to see that? I mean, I can't say who who, who really knows, but I just think that if we start to get curious, like whenever I run out of a way to understand things, I just go back to the basic, just put a question mark next to it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like just put a question mark. I'll, I'll give you one more example. When I was listening to testimonials for this program, I mentioned DNRS, which I haven't done yet, everybody. So, but I'm I'm deeply considering it. But when I was looking at listening to testimonials, there was a woman on the website. She was a yoga teacher, and she was getting more and more sensitive to EMFs, more and more sensitive to noise, more and more sensitive. And she was saying, I started to think I was having superpowers even which I completely relate to. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of senses do, you know, it's like, oh, I'm getting heightened perception. So she goes through this program, which is basically a training for your limbic system to rewire and retrain your limbic system. And, you know, it goes away. But her concept that this is a superpower, if she didn't test that, could have kept her stuck in a traumatized body and nervous system, Mm -hmm. right? And I think so much of what we're talking about just has to do with that. It's like my concept, oh, well, it's just mold poisoning. I'll never be well. Or if you have a concept that says I am an introvert and I need so much time alone, I don't even know if I could be in a relationship. Or a concept that says, you know, to suffer is the benevolent act and I am a benevolent person, therefore I am the sufferer. Mm -hmm. All of these are concepts but is it really true yeah and and I think that's the cool part I love the question mark pointer and you know the other thing I'll just say because you and I are slow motion living out this process in public and so people are listening to these conversations and everyone we interact to who listens to the show is on their own path um and so sometimes there can be some concern or annoyance of is it always going to be three steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, two steps back. And, you know, just to counter that movement a little bit of the mind of like, this is murky and annoying and never ending and it's never ending for Brooke and Vanessa, which means it's going to be never ending for me too. There is a thoroughness to this process that's out of all of our hands where things are being healed all the way through. And in my experience directly and in what I've noticed about the lovely teachers and human beings we get to engage with, there is such a thing as complete healing in, let's say, um, for some people, it's like a big You know, like Byron Katie, David Thomas, um, reading Jan Frazier's book, When Fear Falls Away. I read that in the heart of my dark night and I spent my the whole time reading it being so annoyed with her because it was she was just like, I don't know, fear went away, it never came back. I was like, fuck you. (laughs) Not helpful. Actually, I loved her book, but it was very painful to read it at that time. Because that my experience has been in that it's much more tenuous you know, a big opening and then a whoop back in prison and big opening and whoop back in prison. But then things will clear at the root structure. And I understand what someone like Jan Frazier was saying in her memoir, where it's like, I can't go back in. I don't even, I can't even see the box anymore. Like I don't, 
Yeah. Know what you're talking about. And we can see this if we kind of zoom out on ourselves and our own trajectories too, that there are ways that we used to operate that felt true. And now it's like, oh my God, I, that would not have stuck to me for two seconds now because I just, let's say if there's somebody who's mistreating you in your life or a belief system that you need to tolerate a terrible living conditions or whatever, you're like, oh no, now I can just see. So there is such a thing as healing through to completion, but this journey, you know, if, if everything's love, if God is love, it wants actual heaven for us. It doesn't want like kind of, sort of better. <laughs> like it's going for all of it healed all the way through. So that is a an action of love. And then that happens in very different ways and different paces for all of us. But I think it's important to attend to the, oh, it's never ending <laughs> voice. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It, it was almost like even when we were speaking with Miles Neal, and I'm like, wait, we should talk about some of the good news because, you know, we're right. on fire about the bad news here. And and I think that is always helpful um, to point towards because I'm a completely different person. And I still never really can go back to the shame that I had before. Mm -hmm. I never really could. I can't go back. What happens is when my limbic system is utterly hijacked um, physiologically, the shame thoughts dance through the head. Mm -hmm. But I can see them and say, you're Maya. But it doesn't mean I'm comfortable. Almost like if it's like, raining outside and you're chilly and you know the rain's gonna pass like it's not life but yeah it's not but comfortable it's chilly. yeah <laughs> it's, I'm still chilly right you know it's like that but but there is such good news because you know when we talk about dimensions of reality like every dimension of reality has a different way that healing happens so sometimes you know I'll say to people it may feel like you're dealing with the same issue like let's say the issue is fear of money or, you know, fear of relationship or whatever the case is, you know, in level one, you have a certain way that you're going to interact with in dimension one. I'm making this shit up. You guys, there's no <laughs> right, numeric dimensions <laughs> just for conversation sake. You know, you're going to go through a certain process, but as that begins to shift and you enter a new perspective or what we're calling dimension of reality, there's a different kind of healing that happens for that very same wound, mm -hmm. right? And each dimension has a different kind of healing that may happen for that same wound. So oftentimes, I think this was good you brought this in, because when we're speaking about things over the last two years, if you're just listening, it may even sound like we're circling some of the same issues and, and fair enough, right? Yeah, we oh, have certain that money thing, more that challenging right, aspects but in our what, lives. I experience it as is I'm meeting it from a completely different dimension of perspective, mm -hmm. a completely different way of seeing it, holding it, meeting it so that a new level of healing can happen. Yeah. And then things start to move through in much softer ways. Or I, I guess what I'm saying is it's just, it, it becomes not work at a certain point. It's more like you're just aware of the harder aspects in your life and what you're up against. And then things are kind are delivered. You know, like yeah. I get these kind of deliveries of clarity and tenderness towards the self and the aspects that kept that, you know, believed that part just to ground it in reality a little bit like money is one of my more challenging issues, belief system wise that I talk about a lot. And like recently out of nowhere, I wasn't thinking about money at all. It was just like a rando vacuuming the house moment. <laughs> and, uh, and it just landed on me with clarity, total epiphany, like, oh, oh, I've, I've been chronically under earning because I need to feel afraid <laughs> for my survival. Not because I'm a bad person. It was just this. And, and so like the tenderness came at the exact same time as the clarity love and clarity came together where it was like, Oh, Oh, that was just a habit. Now, 
some shrink could have pointed that out to me 20 years ago if they wanted to, but it didn't matter. Like I needed to heal through all the layers. And then when an epiphany lands like that, you see it as absolute truth and you have total love for whatever was operating inside yourself to make that so. Lineage stuff, personal stuff, whatever, blah, blah. And then it goes. Right. You needed the fertile soil right, for that to be able to you know, sprout into the revelation that you had, the kind of revelation that really shifts things. Yeah. Where you're like, you can't believe anymore. You're like, oh, I see you, Maya. In this survival fear. But it's like, oh, oh my gosh, all this time. And there's no shame or berating of the self. Like, I can't believe I was doing this to myself all the time. I wasn't plotting or planning it. It was totally true for all of the years it was true. And... At a certain point, the soil was loose enough that like the, the weed got pulled out and I could see the roots. I could see it go. And I was like, oh, right. The end. Right. And it could be a gentle process. And it is a journey to come to that stage because the ego needs something to anticipate. So you're just observing how your ego needed to keep this to anticipate yeah. with anxiety. I mean, need something that was just another guardian at the gate. Right. Right. Like that's what Matt Kahn said to me when I asked him about my fear of death. And I don't specifically mean my dying. I just mean everyone dying. I just mean, I don't know what I mean, really. Yeah. I'm scared of my parents dying. I'm not really sure. And um, when I asked him about it and was expecting some real fancy pants answer about like a past life or I don't know, reincarnation or I, I don't know, something real mystical. You know, <laughs> I love that shit, you know. And and Matt was like, well, I think that's just possibly your ego's way of having another thing to anticipate. And that what that's been for years, the thing I anticipate. Right. Oh, well, but we're all going to die. Okay just another thing to anticipate because mm -hmm. it's the guard at the gate to yeah. heaven. The ego can't give up blaming, shaming, judging, or anticipating. Those are the movements of the ego. Mm -hmm. So if you notice that those things are looping, okay. Hi, Maya. There's <laughs> hey, <ego>. guardian. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Which kind of guardian at the gate are you? Let's talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to today's show. The show notes, including any resources we'd mentioned, live, as always, at blissandgrit.com. And the specifics related to this show, I think we are a little resource heavy this time around. They will be within this episode's specific post. You can chat us up and support the show in a few ways. First, there are Instagram and Facebook. We're there frequently. Or you can become a supporting member at patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. That's where we have the private forum and also some resources like meditations and a getting started guide for a small monthly amount. And Vanessa and I also work privately with clients all over the world. Um, thanks to the magical internet. That's how we make our living. So if you want some support on the path, that's also available. And that is linked on the Bliss and Grit website, or you can go to vanessascato.com or brookthomas.me. We're very grateful for all of our supporters, all of our Patreon members, all of the listeners out there, the reviews you've already written, the membership support you've already provided, and of course, to our beautiful clients who we are thrilled to be able to work with. And so until next time, actually speaking of next time, we are currently at SAND, the SAND conference in San Jose, California. So we may be skipping an episode next week unless we find a, a miraculous pocket of time, which does happen. Okay. See you next time. <laughs>